Christian Ministries presents Start Our Sabbath. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their studios to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics, and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm Mr. Announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're broadcasting live from Big Sandy, Texas. And here are your hosts for Start Our Sabbath, Wes and Nancy White. Good evening and welcome to our 80th show of Start Our Sabbath. We're the show that as we bring in God's seventh-day Sabbath, we unashamedly talk about Jesus. That's right, because the gospel of Jesus is not just about the kingdom of God that Jesus is going to bring to this earth when he returns. The gospel of Jesus also includes the personage of Jesus, not just his kingdom. And that gospel of Jesus also includes our personal relationship with him as we strive to overcome sin during this age of Satan on this earth. So we proudly proclaim the gospel of Jesus, which includes talking about him as our personal Savior. Yeah, and we do this a lot. As, as we celebrate God's Sabbath, we also confess Jesus so that when that day comes, he'll confess us too. You know, Wes, we've been doing this show for two years now. Our first SOS was in January 2017. That's right. And tonight we're doing our 80th show, the first show of 2019. So let's do the math. Let's do the math. 80 shows in two years, that averages out to 40 shows a year. How do you like that? Mm, wait a minute. There are 52 Sabbaths in a year, and we're only averaging 40 shows in 52 weeks? That's not a very impressive number. I, I think we need to up our game by more, broadcasting more often. Please, no. Now, now, I need your help out there in the chat room. Please tell Nancy that 40 shows a year is enough and that... If we do more than 40 shows a year, you're going to get bored with us. Tell her that. You think our friends are going to tell you that? Well, sure. I would want to look at me more than 40 times a year. In fact, I don't know how they can stand me as often as they do. They probably need more breaks from me, okay? Well, we'll see what they say in the chat. In case you haven't noticed, we are in our new studios, and we're broadcasting on fiber optics. So we hope you're seeing um, an, import, an improvement over the visuals. Talk to us in the chat room. Let us know if there's any problems. Our, we want to know about it. Our new million dollar no no not million dollars our studio. new five hundred thousand dollars no no not that either our no. new ten thousand not ten thousand dollar studios either. our new tens of dollars studio something like that because this studio is costing us a hundred and fifty dollars a week <laughs> a month a month, yes. A hundred, yeah. It would still be a bargain. It would still be a bargain. One hundred and fifty a month. So, so yeah, we, we do not have a million dollar studio. You're looking at one hundred and fifty dollars a month. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Uh, we praise God for these new studios, whatever they're charging us, and we thank all of you who've been praying about this. Yeah, and it's our hope that we can better serve you with this new technology. We hope to do a better job of putting on each show. Okay. Now, Wes, yesterday um, you were talking to a fellow named Jerry from your old job at the hospital. Yeah, we talked a long time, and you know Jerry's not doing well in his job, and I feel badly for him. I was trying to help him uh, do a better job in the hospital where he works. Well, you don't need to be giving advice to Jerry. If Jerry's doing poorly at work, um, it's, it's his fault. Let him make his own decisions. You can't tell people what you should or shouldn't do, what they should or shouldn't do. You can't. You just told me what to do. <laughs> Well, yes, I did. But when I do it, it's not telling people what to do. It's counseling. Oh, I get it now. Nancy's life is a lecture series with meal breaks, okay? Okay, so um, I'm just seeing the 18 up here. So okay. uh, we, I, I think we want to be in the picture. Well, you got to say your line. Not I will, right I will. Okay. But I mean, that whole time we were just saw 18. We didn't see us. I'm not trying to tell you what to oh, do. Oh, oh, I see. We got the close-up. I yes. see what you're saying. Thank you. I'm so, new studios. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. try this. So, so, right. Okay, so we oh, thank so you. we didn't get to see uh, your beautiful face on uh, that one, so yeah, how can right. people get tired? <laughs> okay. All right, so right now you've got um, this picture of Alex up. Yeah, uh, yeah. here it is. 
Uh, this, this, little, yeah. this little guy is from our local Church of God Seventh Day congregation. He's such an adorable little guy. Yeah, you know, I think Alex was the first person who ever met us at that local congregation. As we were walking up the steps of the church building, uh, Alex was there to greet us. That's right, he was. And we've got a terrific group of young people in our local church of God's Seventh Day who participate in music. Yeah, I think we've got a total of 11 kids who are learning instruments right now. We have flute players. Uh, we've got two boys on guitar. This, this thing keeps going back, and it shouldn't. Okay, uh, we've got some kids on uh, keyboards. We've got girls playing guitar. We've even got a drummer. So. All right, all of these kids in our music program, all of, all of them, Alex is the youngest. Yeah, uh, he insists. Uh, on being involved, he will not be denied. He wants to play with us Absolutely. in church. Absolutely. He insists on being involved in our praise music every single Sabbath. That's right. And he's going to do his part no matter what. Um, he wants to be just like the men who play guitar at church. He stands up there with them, and when he's finished, he puts his pick back in the strings just the way the men do. He is so into this. Yeah, and I project that this kid, Alex, is going to be a great addition to the music program of God's church. So that's our salute to Alex tonight. He's a terrific little boy. And once again, we want to remind you uh, that we welcome your comments and your questions uh, in the chat room. Please talk to us. Yes, please talk to us in the chat room. Please tell us what's on your mind tonight. We love hearing from you. Yeah, and once again, a big thank you to Carl and Ginger Mimi for all their hard work. And I hope Nancy got the right picture up there tonight. <coughs> Looks like she I, did. I do. Sorry about last time, Mimi. Okay. See, Ginger Mimi's right there. Uh huh. All right, um, I certainly did. That's okay, right. good. As you know, Carl does a wonderful job as our webmaster for our two websites. They're um, the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association and Dynamic Christian Ministries. Yes, he does a wonderful job. So thank you, Carl, for all your hard work and your professionalism. I don't know what we do without Carl. He runs the websites at rldea.com as well as uh, dynamicchristianministries.org. And every Friday evening, he connects our YouTube feed our Facebook feed to YouTube. That's right. And I've been watching Amy Hohertz's Facebook page regarding housewarming gifts for Mimi. Looks like y'all are having a real good time with this out there. Yeah, we are. So if you want to check out Amy's Facebook um, on this effort, you can go to her Facebook page. And she might even be in the chat room tonight. You can talk That's to right. her about it. Speaking of our websites, let me throw in a real quick plug here. Uh, the websites that Carl takes care of, i got to tell you about a real cool thing that we have on the RLDEA.com website. And I've talked about this before, but I want to mention it again. If you go to RLDEA.com, you'll find what we call printable Bible studies. And these uh, are Bible studies that have been taken from sermons from the late Ronald L. Dart. These printables are set up so that you just click on them, you print them, you punch holes in them, and put them in a Bible study notebook. Perfect. They got all kinds of Bible studies out there on our printable section, like this one that you can see on the screen. Uh, let's see if I can do a close-up on it. Um, I know most of you who are watching the show, you've been in the church for years and years, and this study, uh, how to read the Bible, might be a little bit basic for you. And so uh, take this under consideration. It's not basic for young people or new people. So if you know someone who's new in the faith, you can print this Bible study and give it to that person. And we've got stuff for everybody, like uh, our 10 parts uh, study on the Ten Commandments. Again, perfect for new people. But then we've got studies that are a little more esoteric, like you know things like the like meditation, all kinds of good topics that you can turn to. So please check out uh, the printables tab on rldea.com. And let me just take a moment to say, uh, we did have one person say the volume could be louder. So maybe the microphones aren't picking it up and we need to project. Okay, so the volume needs to be louder. It said it could be louder. Could be louder. Okay, so um, is it Wes or Nancy? Maybe you can talk to us in the chat room. Is it Wes or Nancy that needs to be louder? Because I'm pretty close to my microphone. All right, let us know. All right, now in addition to the technical stuff that's done by Carl, we also have the wonderful Terry Lucenhide who's handling her technical stuff all the way out in California. And Nancy, don't we have a wonderful family of people who put on this show on Friday evenings? We, we really do. We cer yeah. It certainly is a wonderful family. It's amazing how we're able to coordinate all this technical stuff uh, going on in California and here in Big Sandy and in North Carolina. And we give God the praise for this. So please don't forget to pray about this because all it takes is for one of us, and it's usually me, it just takes one of us to not set a switch right or for one of us not to put a plug in a cable and the whole show comes crashing down. So please 
pray that God will guide us in everything we do on this show. That's right. Once again, I'm grateful that God provides for this ministry because we women are just as much a part of it as the men. That's right. We rely on the women so much on this effort. We acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of the ladies. In addition to Terry and Bill, and Mimi and Carl will always give thanks to God for his generosity and his mercy. And as we give him thanks, we also want to thank you for watching the show. That's right. We put the show together every week. We acknowledge that it is our privilege to serve you through this program. And you could be doing other things right now, and we're grateful that you decided not to do those other things, but instead you've chosen to spend your time with us studying and fellowshipping. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, Bill is going to talk about Sabbath keepers in government. Nancy is going to talk about it was the best times and the worst of times. And Wes is going to talk about nurture versus nature and how we affect the future relationship of our church's young people with God. And don't forget that we want to hear from you in the chat room, so get busy and talk to us. We do this show not for you, we, or not for us. <laughs> okay. We don't do this show for us. We do it for you. That's right. So please uh, help us out by talking to us. Uh, we welcome God's love that's here tonight in the Ecclesia. And let's open with prayer, shall we? Yes, let's do that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are with us tonight. We thank you for the love that you have shown to us. You love us so much. You created us. You created this wonderful universe for us to live in. You sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins, and we thank you so very much for that, Father. We thank you for the technology that uh, you have given to us that we can put on this show, and we ask for you to guide and direct everything that we say and do on this show. Now, please put your presence on everyone who's participating, whether it's uh, somebody out there in the audience or somebody who's uh, running a board somewhere across the country or those of us sitting under the lights. Father, please put your uh, guidance and direction on all of us as we attempt to do your will in everything. So we give you praise and thanks, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, let's now take a quick commercial break. Okay. scary isn't it <laughs> all right yeah i mean as long as our hearts are going so yeah. let's get into our first segment um tonight what have you got for us this evening sweetheart well it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom it was the age of foolishness it was the epic of of belief it was the epic of incredulity it was a season of light it was a season of darkness it was a spring of hope it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the most present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. This is the opening paragraph of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. But for some of you right now, it is the best of times. And for some of you right now, it's the worst of times. But for many of you right now, it's kind of both at the same time. And this is not unique to our era. Let's talk about Daniel and his friends. They found themselves in what must have seemed like the worst of times because they were taken away to a strange land as teenagers and forced to serve a foreign king in a country with foreign customs. How about Esther? She found herself in what must have seemed like the worst of times because she was yanked out of her cozy home as a teenager and put on parade before the king. At that moment, Esther was a virgin who had no experience at all of what she was expected to do. Then again, that lack of experience was exact, the exact prerequisite for her being chosen. This whole unfortunate situation regarding Esther would be life-changing, a life-changing event for any girl who would end up in cloistered captivity and high privilege, but it was worse for Esther because it was coupled with the fact that she had a terrible secret to hide. Then there's Ruth. She too was in a situation which must have seemed like the worst of times. She was part of a triple play tragedy leading to widowhood for her mother-in-law, for her sister-in-law, and for herself. And the resulting poverty 
poverty created a need for them to move to a strange land. Then we have the 11 remaining of the 12 disciples of Jesus who are in what seemed to be to them the, a worst of time situation. Their master, the one they'd identified and followed as a Messiah, was in the grave. He'd been publicly crucified. These 11 men had to endure the knowledge that in their own, that one of their own had betrayed him. They had to endure the knowledge that their master had been brutally beaten before his death. They had to endure the knowledge that there were now bounties on their own heads. And we can't forget Joseph, who no doubt found himself in a situation where it seemed like the worst of times. He'd been betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. And later he found himself in prison on the strength of a false accusation. And what about us today? Many claim we are in the worst of times right now. Depending on which mix of news sources you follow, it may seem as though the media is tr trying to convince us all that things cannot get any worse in our current world. What's confusing is, it, is that there are other news sources that seem to say we're in the best of times. Perhaps you're facing such a personal trial right now that, at least thus far in your life, these really are the worst of times for you. Alternately, perhaps you're going, things are going so very well for you and your family right now, in your personal life, that these really are some of the best of times for you. Here's the most important truth for us Christians. As we walk this earth as mortal human beings, at any moment, at any intervention from God, at any turn of the screw by Satan, at the moment of any good or bad decision, life has the potential of being the worst of times or the best of times, or even both at the same time. In each one of the biblical incidents I've mentioned thus far, the faithfulness of our merciful God turned the worst of times into the best of times by offering them the opportunity of a lifetime. And he did it through the worst of times. Esther became queen and saved her nation. Ruth found love and acceptance in her new land and bore a child who was part of the lineage of David and Jesus. Daniel rose to high authority, counseled kings, saw the future. Joseph rose to power that allowed him not only to save Egypt from starvation, but his own family too. During their worst of times, none of these faithful, faithful servants had any idea what God was about to do through them and for them. And even without this knowledge, they lived faithful lives of integrity and obedience. We have to acknowledge that not every Bible story ends as well as others do. The disciples, they healed the sick, sick they spread the gospel, they died faithful. But many of them died as faithful martyrs, enduring horrible deaths. But again, they lived faithful lives of integrity and obedience to the very end. And this is my message for tonight. Regardless of what's going on around me, my obligation is to live a life of steadfast and consistent integrity. If I don't like the president, if I like the president, if I like my job, if I don't, if I'm doing well or if I'm suffering greatly. <clears throat> the idea for this message was sparked by an article I read from and about the news so source Reuters. And I'm sure you can look it up. I intended to post the link in the chat room, but I forgot to copy it. There are several good quotes in this article, but the final paragraph sums up what inspired me. And here's the quote. This is our mission. This is Reuters speaking. This is our mission in the U.S. and everywhere. We, t we make a difference in the world because we practice professional journalism that is both intrepid and unbiased. We operate with calm integrity, not just because it's our rule book, but because over 165 years, it has enabled us to do the best work and the most good. They were addressing how Reuters intends to act in the face of the allegations of them being fake news and what they call potentially a potentially contentious relationship with the current administration. In a nutshell, they intended to act no differently than their internal mandate for integrity had led them to do over the world, all over the world for that 165 years. You may disagree with Reuters having anything to grouse about, but you have to give them props for what they intend to do in the face of real or imagined persecution, and that is operate with integrity. This is exactly what God asks of us believers. 
In the good times, we should never succumb to the temptation of forgetting God as Israel did. We cannot grow lax in obedience or in prayer and Bible study. We cannot let riches and success turn our heads. Our God is Lord of the best of times, and we must be faithful children, living lives of integrity, obeying God's law of love, giving to others, serving our fellow man. This is especially vital in the best of times when Satan may tempt us to let up a little bit and just enjoy the things we've acquired. Then in the bad times, we, we can't be tempted to give up. We can't let our obedience or character waver. We can't curse God as Job's wife advised him to do. Job 2.9 tells us God is Lord of the worst of times, and we must be faithful children, giving to others even from our meager means or from our over-budgeted time. Our lives was, must always be spent toward the ultimate cause of inspiring others to glorify God. 1 Peter 2.12 tells us, Live such good lives among the pagans that though it, they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We must do so in good times and in bad. In Matthew 5.14, Jesus instructs us as follows. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all their house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. This light shining so we glorify God thing is a Christian mandate no matter what whirlwind of joy or cyclone of trouble circles around us. No matter who is the top official in the country where we live, no matter how Satan attacks us personally, no matter what blessings God bestows. Where are you right now? Are you in the best of times? Are you in the worst of times? Are you in a time that's a little of both? No matter. As we turned in our 2018 calendars not long ago and started writing 2019 on our checks, we don't know what the year ahead holds for us. Perhaps like me, you're already starting the character cleaning you need in order for, to prepare for the annual Lord's Supper, even though your house cleaning aspect of it might be a ways off yet. Right now, today, this is a good time to reflect on the year behind us, on what you have faced and how you faced it, and this is a good time to recommit yourself or ourselves to a life of steadfast integrity, a life of love and service, no matter what lies ahead in 2019 or beyond. I pray that God has great things in store for you in the year ahead, that he will take your captivity, your illness, the false accusations, the fear you feel, the troubles you face, whatever trial you're facing, and turn it into victory for him and his people. I pray that you will turn all the blessings that flow your way back again to God in service to him and his children. Stay faithful, my friends, through the best of times and the worst of times, and see how God will use you in his own good time. I love to hear your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Write to me tonight in the chat room or anytime at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. As Nancy mentioned, you can email her anytime you want, but tonight at this very moment, we welcome your comments and your questions in the chat room. Talk to us because we want to hear from you. Well, we want to hear this message. We want to hear this message, but we can't find the commercial. Okay, it's no, not there. Not. All right. Um, at, um, at this point, I want to remind everyone to check out the Facebook group called Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. It has over 25,000 followers, and I remember it wasn't that long ago when it was only 19,000 followers. That was just a few months ago. Yeah. It's now up to 25,000 and counting. So if you're not a follower of Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, you are missing out. So check it out. This Facebook page is run by my good buddy. Bill Lucenhide, who's out in California. Now, before we bring Bill on the show tonight, I want uh, I want you to know that Terry and I had a chat about you two guys yesterday. You did what? What did you and Terry talk about me and Bill yesterday? Well, t Terry and I both heard you and Bill talking on the phone Wednesday night. Her yeah. and her and me on my. Uh, she heard what Bill said, and I heard what you said. No problem. We weren't talking about anything bad. That's right. Please tell me. Didn't the conversation go something like this? 
You said, I don't think people use the word ahoy enough. And Bill said, right. And whatever happened to the word fiddlestick? Yeah. And you complained about nobody saying balderdash anymore. So what's your point? After that call, Terry asked me if I'd ever listened to a conversation between you and Bill. Uh -huh. And I said, no, this is my first time, and I'll never make that mistake again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you and Terry just don't appreciate good, good words. But these are old-fashioned words that nobody uses anymore. You say potato, I say potato. Let's see if we can bring Bill onto the show. Let's see if we can make something work tonight, okay? Uh, let's see. Come on, Bill, where are you? Oh, we've lost Bill. What? Oh, no. We've lost our connection with Bill. Um, hmm. Was his on the division of the church? No, that's the that's the commercial. Oh, okay. So he's he's here somewhere. All right, let me find him. No, he's not in here. Um, go the black, this black screen, the one before that. See oh. if you can find Clay. Okay, there he is. Well, good evening, Russ and Nancy. Uh, happy Sabbath to you, Bill. Well, I'm sorry that Terry and Nancy were dis. Convoluted by our conversation. <laughs> That's a shame they don't appreciate old-fashioned words. Indeed, it's their loss. <laughs> well, listen, what, what I'm going to uh, speak about this evening is what we'll call Sabbath Keepers in Government. You know, as Christians serving as God's ambassadors, we face interesting questions in regards to what level of participation should we have in regards to political activity, voting, even serving in office. Should Sabbatarians be serving the civil government? It's a question that many Seventh-day Sabbath observing groups have tried to tackle over the last century. There's different opinions on the appropriateness of doing so. And the, the issue has actually been debated down to the point of whether or not a Christian should even vote. Now, I will be taking an overview of Sabbatarians throughout history who have served in office or have been involved in government. And we're going to discover that Seventh-day observers have a long history of serving in a godly fashion in secular government, and frankly being very effective doing so. So let's take a look at the Bible, a political service in the Bible. Early in the Bible, we can take note of Lot. In uh, Genesis 19, verse 1, we can see that Lot is sitting in the city gates. Now that was a position of honor and also was a, a position of place of rulership, according to most commentators. And we can take note of Proverbs 31, verse 23 for some insight on this. It reads, Her husband is known in the gates where he sits amongst the elders of the land. That's where business was being transacted. Lot is regarded as a righteous lot in 2 Peter 2, 7. And though Sodom itself was wicked, there's no evil report of Lot serving uh, in the civil capacity from Scripture. No, no condemnation about that. Later on, Joseph rose to power in... Um, or virtual power over the leading state of its era, which was Egypt. Joseph considered his position in Egypt's government to be a direct result of God's will. And he tried to calm his brother's fears after their father's death when he said to them, quote, God, God has made me Lord over all of Egypt. And that's in Genesis 45, verse 9. He, God, sent me to preserve you, sent me before you to preserve life. Obviously, God can and does work through righteous Sabbath observers in political office. Likewise, Moses, he was a chief prince in Egypt. And Daniel and his three companions were selected amongst the captives in Babylon for training in government. There's no inference of them refusing to do the task or being reluctant about it. And after Daniel was promoted to be the ruler of the whole province of Babylon, and the chief of governors of all, over all the wise men of Babylon, he asked that could my three friends be set up over the affairs of the whole province of Babylon? And Daniel's request was granted. We find that in Daniel 2, verse 48. He volunteered for the task. He wasn't forced to do it. The three commandment, uh, companions of his were promoted again after going through the amazing trial of the fiery service, of the fiery furnace. And again, they didn't refuse to serve. When Belshazzar became the ruler of Babylon, he made Daniel an important ruler after he interpreted the handwriting on the, on the wall on the banquet wall. And just hours before Belshazzar was defeated by Darius, in chapters uh, 5, verse 29 of Daniel, 
Darius the Mede recognized leadership in Daniel and made him first of the three rulers of the whole kingdom. In the book of Esther, we have the story of Mordecai the Jew, who sat in the king's gate and was one of King Ahasuerus' servants. That's in Esther 2, verse 19. The king's gate was a place where the affairs and the business of the king was carried on. Later, when Haman was hanged, Mordecai did not refuse the chance to replace him. It wasn't, again, required for him to, to be in rulership. He didn't refuse the task. In Esther 10, verse 3, we see that Mordecai was placed right next to the king in power. Let's move well forward to modern times. And let's talk about a very interesting character, a Sabbath-keeping American founding father. Yes, there was, a, in the beginnings of our country, a founding father who was a Sabbath keeper. And who I'm speaking of is Samuel Ward, who was born in Newport, Rhode Island, May 27, 1725. Now, Newport, Rhode Island is the location of the first Sabbatarian church in America. That was founded uh, back in 1671 by Stephen Mumford. Now, Samuel Ward, both of his parents were keepers of the Seventh-day Sabbath in both his, in both his paternal and maternal lines. <clears throat> family lines. He can also lay claim to his lineage to John Ward, a cavalry officer in the service of Oliver Crom Cromwell, who fought against the tyranny of the English crown. On Samuel Ward's parents' tombstones, was actually carved a testimony to their faith of the Sabbath day. The lineage of Samuel Ward traced also through Roger Williams, and that gives another strong clue of who he was. Roger Williams was the founder of Rhode Island and was the maverick pioneer of religious freedom in America, and we owe him an awful lot. He was one of the first advocates of the concept of separation of church and state and for religious freedom. As an Anabaptist, Williams can be thanked for creating the first colony that practiced religious freedom. A lot of the colonies had state religions at that time. And it's, it, conversely, it's interesting too, the first Jewish synagogue in America can also trace its history to Newport, Rhode Island, around 1680. And it only could exist there because of the freedoms found in little tiny Rhode Island, the smallest states there of the entire Union. But with a rich bloodline of faith, Samuel Ward served in many political offices in Rhode Island. And like his father, he was elected to the office of governor as a Sabbatarian in 1762. Now those were pivotal times for America. And in 1765, there was the infamous Stamp, Stamp Act, and that was thrust upon the colonies. Of all the governors of the different states in the, in the colonies, there was only one who had the courage to refuse an oath to enforce and sustain this law. It was Samuel Ward the Sabbatarian governor of Rhode Island. A man of conviction of the scriptures, he was also a man of conviction in the secular world. He refused to swear an allegiance to either the crown nor to enforce the Stamp Act, and he did so at great personal peril to himself. Throughout the early 1770s, Ward was a key man in the organization of the Continental Congress. In fact, the very first delegates to the Continental Congress came from fellow Rhode Islander Stephen Hawkins and Samuel Ward himself. Yes, a Sabbath keeper can lay claim to being a founding, founding father in this what became the greatest nation in human history. Now, Ward was a, a member of the Seventh-day Baptist Church, but he had a great many works to, to uh, help forge the freest country in history of the world. Only in America could God find a place where the Sabbath could find free practice and blossomed to be the exporter of that truth to the world. It was time. God needed a place where there was religious freedom. Samuel Ward himself was the one who nominated George Washington to be the commander of the Continental Army. That was providential. And before Ward's untimely death in 1776, he helped to collaborate with Thomas Jefferson in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Samuel Ward had a fantastic uh, legacy in his family, all Sabbath keepers, including his son, Samuel Ward Jr., who was a lieutenant colonel in the Revolutionary Army, a grandson who became the president of the New York Stock Exchange, and his great-granddaughter, you might have heard of her, Julia Ward Howe, was the composer of a well-known and historic and well-loved Battle Hymn of the Republic, who wrote that in 1862. 
And like many Sabbatarians of that era, she was a staunch anti-slavery abolitionist. Many, many Sabbatarians were against the slavery movement. In later years, she was instrumental in creating the first Mother Day as a reaction to all the carnage of the Civil War and even the Franco-Prussian War of, of 1870. There's been many other Sabbath observers that have held political office, long list, all around the world. And most of these off, uh, office orders have been associated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There have been uh, at least three congressmen. There's been a couple mayors of major cities. Uh, the Governor General of Jamaica, a Chief Magistrate of Trinidad and Tobago, and a Parliamentary Leader in the Dutch House of Representatives, all Sabbath Keepers of the Seventh-day Adventist flavor. The Seventh-day Baptist, besides Samuel Ward, who we just talked about, also can lay claim to the service of Jennings Randolph. He was born in Salem, West Virginia in 1902, and a descendant of colonist William Randolph, and both his grandfather and father were mayors of Salem. West Virginia. There's been many Sabbatarians in Salem, West Virginia. So Jennings Randolph, he served in Congress for six consecutive terms. At his death in 1998, he was the last surviving House of Representative uh, rep, uh, member who had survived the famous 100 days of Franklin Roosevelt's administration. He had legislation including a bill which advocated for and provided jobs for the blind. He created the Civil Air Patrol and a bill that proposed the creation of a Department of Peace after the conclusion of World War II. In the present, we have uh, Seventh-day Adventist Ben Carson, who was a candidate for the United States President, and now uh, serves uh, uh, in the cabinet for Mr. Donald Trump. And he received significant votes in many state primaries, who was, was a contender, a leader leading in some of the polls at one point. And the... Uh, Sabbatarian Churches of God from the Armstrong heritage have historically been averse to service in the political office. But in spite of it, there's been a few who have served. Uh, there's some have served as aldermen, city council members, and a couple have even served as mayors. In 2010, myself, me, Bill Lewis and I, uh, and I've been a longtime member of the Church of God from those traditions, was a candidate for the United States Congress in the 45th District of California. I received the highest percentage vote for a third party candidate in, for any office in the nation, running with the Constitution Party. And that's with, if there was both a Republican and Democrat running, I had the highest third party percentage vote for any office, whether Congress, Governor, or, uh, or otherwise, Senator. My uh, platform was uh, one of pro-life, traditional marriage, faith, family, and freedom. I actually ended up working on the executive committee of the board of the party nationwide for the Constitution Party. And I am, uh, was also honored to have the privilege of serving twice as a presidential elector for the United States Electoral College. I am the first candidate for a major office from my religious heritage, and I'm honored to hold that privilege. I... Uh, Got this from the Church of God Seventh Day in a statement received from Calvin Burrell, who was the former editor of the church's magazine, The Bible Advocate, and was the president of the North American Ministerial Council. He wrote me and said, I'm happy to assure you that 99% of us in the Church of God Seventh Day have no scruples against public service, including running for and holding elective office. In fact, we recommend it. Sabbath keeping influence in the United States Senate. We have one right now. The chaplain of the United States Senate opens each session of the United States Senate with a prayer. He provides and coordinates religious programs and pastor, pastoral care for senators, their staffs, and their families. The chaplain is appointed by a majority vote of the members of the Senate on a resolution nominating an individual for the position. And that position was actually created on the advice of Ben Franklin. And this position, of chaplain for the Senate, has existed since 1789. Chaplain Barry C. Black, a Seventh-day Adventist, is the current chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Prior to his appointment, Black served as chief chaplain of the United States Navy, and he also served as a rear admiral. How about the Supreme Court, since we're talking about the different branches of the United States government? Do you know there's at least 14 depictions of the Ten Commandments found in the Supreme Court building? 
It's remarkable. Several are depicted as being in the hand of Moses on the tablets, you know. Others are just the tablets alone with the Ten Commandments written on them. So minimally, we can say that even the, the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath Commandment, can be found in the judicial branch of government at the United States in the Supreme Court. So in conclusion, Sabbath keepers can take pride in the fact that throughout our history that we have served with character, integrity, and faith at many levels of government, whether it was in the Old Testament or whether it's now here in the New Testament times and in different countries around the world or even here in the United States. They have contributed in civic duty to their communities and nations. In the saga of America, we also see the hand of commandment-keeping, Sabbath-observing Christians contributing to its founding and to its rich history. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, as always, we welcome your thoughts, your comments, and your questions in the chat room. Uh, let's take a break. We're going to have a quick commercial. We'll be right back. There are always going to be church splits and church divisions. Church division is almost inevitable within the body of Christ. This common occurrence takes place because there are so many causes for division. Doctrine, differing personalities, money, influence, assets, and even music. But here's the important part of the topic of church division. When you find yourself in the crossfire of two warring factions of a church split, how do you react? Whom do you support? Who's right and who's wrong? At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a helpful message on this subject. In this sermon, Ron Dart shows what guidance the Bible gives us on the heartbreaking subject of division within the church. The title of this message is, An Open Letter to a Divided Church. You can find it on the audio recordings tab of our website, rldea.com. This message is free. Again, the title is, An Open Letter to a Divided Church, at rldea.com. Thank you, Gary Gibbons. Before we get into our final segment, um, I've got to do a shout out to one of our viewers, and I want to say a big uh, thank you to Mary Eppard, who lives out in New Mexico. Mary inherited a guitar and two auto harps um, th 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 from a deceased relative. And as you know, Mary could have sold these fine instruments. She could have made some money off of them. But Mary knows that I'm teaching music to kids in our local church. And Mary sent me these instruments. Now get this. Not only did Mary give up any money that she could have made on selling these instruments, she also had to spend money to ship them to me. So Mary lost money twice. So... Mary, I want to thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for the church kids. All right, let's get into our final segment tonight. Let's begin by my, my reminding you of something that we tell you all the time. On SOS, we do not have all the answers. And if you're coming to this show to get answers to every question, you're going to be disappointed. No one has all the answers in this age. It won't be until after Jesus returns that we'll have all the answers. Well, why not? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that we see through a glass darkly. Please write that down. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We see through a glass darkly. As Christians, we absolutely do not have perfect Bible understanding at this time. And I know this bothers a lot of people who think that since we have the Holy Spirit, we should be able to understand all things biblical at this time but we don't have that knowledge. So keep that in mind. For this reason, there's nothing wrong with having to say, I don't know. So as we move forward in our third segment tonight, please keep that perhaps uncomfortable, but very important point in mind. We don't have all the answers. Now, um, my buddy uh, Schutz and I were talking this last week, and Schutz was born and raised Catholic. And this week he mentioned that some of the nuns in his Catholic school taught the kids that if you're a bad kid, not only will you not go to heaven, but your parents also will not go to heaven. Oh my, I never heard that one. Yeah, some of the nuns explained that God is not going to allow people into heaven who raise kids who aren't also in heaven. Oh. Now, let's do a qualifier. We're not bashing Catholics tonight. We don't bash Catholics on this show. Most of you already know this, so please don't think we're bash bashing Catholicism this evening. And also, I don't think that 
What I just told you is the official teaching of the Catholic Church. I'm just telling you what Schutz, Schutze related was taught to him in parochial school. He said that sometimes the nuns would go a little over the top in their teaching to the kids. All right, why do I bring this story up about kids, uh, about parents not going to heaven if their kids aren't in heaven? Well, I bring it up because there are a lot of you out there who have been faithfully following God for most of your adult life. And for some reason, this love of the Lord has not rubbed off on your kids. Many of you have raised your kids to be in the faith, yet your kids have completely left the faith. And this bothers you. Let's be honest. I know this does. This bothers you. Some of you are racked with guilt that your kids are not in the church. You feel <clears throat> that it's somehow your fault that your kids are not following the teachings of the Bible. With that in mind, tonight in our final segment, let's talk about the latest research that's been done regarding nature versus nurture. This evening, I'm going to quote from several social scientists as well as looking at the Bible because I believe this topic of nature versus nurture almost always ends up being interesting to Christians, even those who don't have kids, because we're always concerned about the next generation, and we're always asking uh, questions like, why don't they have the same enthusiasm that we do? So that's why we're looking at this. Let's start with some research that was done by a lady named Faye Flam, F-L-A-M. You can find her on the internet. Flam writes for publications such as The Economist, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Psychology Today, and Science Magazine. Her degree is in geophysics from the California Institute of Technology. She's a smart lady. And again, on SOS, we look at science because we know that we don't need to be afraid of science. All right, another topic. Let's get back to Flam. Last month, Flam reported on some new research where she pointed out how when you go to family reunions, many times you say to yourself, whoa, looks like my sisters and brothers are turning into our parents. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, Plum says, that's no illusion. She says, and I'm going to quote her, she says, as scientists have learned from nature versus nurture uh, that they've done on uh, twins and adoptees, humans become more like our biological parents and other blood family members as we get older, end quote. Now, this can be scary because a whole lot of us don't want to become like our parents, either physically or emotionally. Am I right? I know I don't want to be anything like my parents. But here's the real kicker. Flam points out that this business of becoming our parents is too often unavoidable. And one of the people she quotes is a scientist by the name of Robert Plomin, P-L-O-M-I-N, and you can look him up on the internet, you can research him. He's a behavioral geneticist at the King's College in London. The woman says his research shows that more often than not, kids take after their birth mothers and not after their adoptive parents when it comes to cognitive skills, interests, and personality traits. And he says as they get older, their physical resemblances only get stronger. Now, let's clarify. We're talking about kids who take after their birth parents and who have not even been around these birth parents. They weren't raised by them. They've never even met their birth parents, and yet they take after them. These kids who have been raised totally by non-blood-related adoptive parents, probably hundreds of miles from their birth parents. They were raised by adoptive parents, and yet so many times they turn into their birth parents and they've never even met them. Plowman says this doesn't just apply to literary, musical, mathematical, or scientific inclinations. He says it also applies to non-genetic traits such as television watching, and of all things, the likelihood of getting divorced. Yeah. Plowman says that in his research, adoptive parents have surprisingly little influence on anything measurable. Isn't that astounding? He says adoptive parents don't have the levers to pull that they think they do. He says, despite all the hype about domineering families and how domineering families have this influence on children, he says, the reality is that kids are not just blobs of clay that you can mold. He said, kids are much more complex than that. Now, 
I can't wait into much on the subject. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, a, I'm not qualified to evaluate this latest research that, that's out there. I can't say, oh, this stuff is accurate or it's a bunch of baloney. I can't say that. Nevertheless, I find it fascinating. And let's do a timeout. Let's do a timeout here. Does this mean that people are shaped only by nature and that nurture has nothing to do with how the kids turn out? No, that's, that's not what Plowman and these other behavioral scientists are saying. He's just saying that people have placed too much emphasis on nurture and not enough on nature. And we're going to see that the Bible gets into this nature versus nurture thing. But first, back to Plowman. He makes the following statement in a book he wrote. He says, what makes us different environmentally are random experiences, not systematic forces like families. That's amazing, end quote. He says we're molded by unpredictable forces and that they're that the very nature of the clay that we are is a mix of our DNA ancestors. I think the lesson that we can learn from this scientist is that when we look at genetics for a person, we see a future that might be, but not necessarily a future that must be. For example, you might have a high risk for becoming an alcoholic because of genetics. We know a lot of people like that because one or both their parents have an alcohol problem they have a tendency to have that, that problem. It's, a, it's scientifically a valid concern. Today, most recognize that if one of your parents has a problem with booze, you might be careful because you just might have the proclivity for booze too, so you gotta be careful. So it's good for a person to recognize it so he can make a conscious decision about his relationship with alcoholic beverages. Okay, Are you on the same page with me? I think this is kind of common knowledge. How about this one? A person might have a genetic predisposition to being overweight. So should the person give up and say, well, being overweight runs in my family? No. If that's the case, that weight, pro weight problems run in your family, you don't give up. Instead, you try to get it to a healthy weight and maintain that healthy weight. Okay. Now, because of all this new research that's available to us, we now know that genetic tests today can give us information on traits that are influenced by a multitude of our genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's switch gears now because when we're discussing this controversial topic, we've got to go to the scriptures to see what we can learn. But remember, as we see through a glass darkly, because before this is over, I'm not sure we're going to have less questions. We might have more questions. At and least that, different questions. At least different questions. And I don't think that should scare us that we don't have the answers. Right. We're certainly not, uh, tonight, we're not going to just look at the secular researchers on something like this. We can't ignore what God has to say on these issues of children. And when we go to the scriptures, believe it or not, the Bible is not silent when it comes to the dilemma of nature versus, uh, nature versus nurture. Let's first look at Proverbs 22, 6. I think this is an, a misunderstood scripture. Oh, yeah. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Now, let's be really clear on this verse that seems to lean toward nurture instead of towards nature. Can, can we agree with that? All right. Does Proverbs 22, 6 guarantee that if you raise your child properly in a Christian environment, he's going to stay with God all the way until his old age? Does it say that? No. Proverbs 22.6 is not a guarantee of success for Christian parenting. And we all know from example after example that kids who are properly raised can and do indeed reject God's way. You've seen this happen with people's kids. You've seen it happen in your own family maybe. And here's where it's getting controversial because we do have Christians who actually say that, well, if you raise your child properly, this scripture is an absolute guarantee he will not stray. Mm. And when you ask them about examples of kids who do indeed stray, they say this. They say, well, <clears throat> they say the parents only seemed to raise that kid right. Obviously, the parent made some horrible mistakes along the way. So when their kid strayed, it was because the parents did not properly follow Proverbs 22, 6. Okay. When we try to present a contrarian view, they won't accept it. Because we point out that a lot of kids in the church were definitely raised right, but 
we point out that as the parents sincerely tried to follow God's way of life, it was sometimes the leadership of the church that's, that threw stumbling blocks in front of the kids mm -hmm. and then the kids straight, not always, but many times. Again, this, they stumbled, the kids stumbled not because of the parents' bad raising, but because of the abuse of the leadership of the church. I've seen this, you've seen this. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it happened enough that it's measurable. Well, our absolutist friends have an answer for that too. They say, well, if the parents brought their kids into a bad church environment, then the parents weren't properly following Proverbs 22, 6. They mm -hmm. say the parents didn't do their job properly if they put their kids into a bad religious environment where the church leadership caused such stumbling blocks. And I think this view of these absolutists is wrong. Now, if, if you disagree with me, write me in the chat room. It's hard if you disagree. But I don't think they're right when they say that. When we study the book of Proverbs, we should never look at its words as sure fire guarantees. Really. Instead, we must understand that the Proverbs are general principles. The Proverbs talk to us about human conduct. They talk about developing righteous character. They give us valuable advice, but they are not absolute promises. They do not say that there will be no exceptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if Proverbs 22, 6 can be claimed as an unqualified promise, then we have to reject other scriptures. You know, the ones about being called. Scriptures like Matthew 22, 14 and John 6, 44. Write that down. Matthew 22, 14, John 6, 44. We don't have time to read it. If we put Proverbs 22, 6 on one side, and on the other side, put Matthew 22, 14 and John 6, 44, then something has to be thrown out of the Bible, one side or another. If we look at Proverbs 22, 6 as an unqualified prop promise, then this whole concept of a supernatural calling of a person is bogus. Yes, Proverbs 22, 6 give us, gives us guidance about raising children, but implicit in Matthew 22, 14, and John 6, John 6, 44, is that many people simply are not called at this time during this age. These two scriptures actually go against both nurture and nature. But we'll, a topic for another time. All right, that's our first scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. We, we beat the, the, the heck out of that one, didn't we? Right. Well, and there's a reason why we spend so much time on it. As we discuss the concept of nature versus nurture, we have to acknowledge that Proverbs 22, 6 seems to lean towards nurture, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Hold that thought. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. Let's continue looking at God's word and let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Exodus 20, verse 4. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, verse uh, Five, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this scripture seems to lean toward nature when you think about it. And, and if you think there are complications regarding Proverbs 22, 6, you ain't seen nothing yet because a lot of people are really confused about Exodus 20, verse 4. And I think that Exodus 20, verse 4 is kind of tied to John chapter 9, verse 1. Write that down. John 9, verse 1. You know, the incident where Jesus comes across a blind man. And John 9, 1, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And theologians have been debating the full meaning of John 9, chapter 1, for centuries. But I think the important point for us tonight is not the debate over the scripture. The important point is this. The disciples, in, in spite of the fact that during Jesus' earthly ministry, they, they were sometimes really stupid, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were insensitive. Sometimes they were actually hateful. In spite of the way that they were during Jesus' earth, earthly ministry, they did understand that there are times when a person does indeed suffer for the actions of his parents. They understood this. And I think that truism was the basis of this question that they asked. 
And, and, and I don't think they were wrong to ask this question of Jesus. I don't see Jesus correcting them on this general concept that oftentimes children do suffer because of the past actions of their parents. Jesus did not dispute the fact that this does happen. And while he didn't disagree with them, he ignored that point in his response. Instead, his whole point was, was that that principle should not apply to this particular man. All right, let's back up. We got a little off topic. Most people watching this show love to quote Exodus 20 because most of us out there in the audience are Sabbath keepers. And if you're not a Sabbath keeper, please don't take that statement to mean that you don't belong here. No, you belong here. Please don't leave. Please stay with us. We welcome your presence. We welcome your thoughts in the chat room. And please don't let the doctrine of the Sabbath be a deal breaker. I'm only bringing Sabbath keeping into this conversation simply because Sabbath keepers love to quote Exodus 20 and Leviticus 23 verses 1 through 4. And they should. But sometimes I think that those of us who keep the Sabbath might want to spend a little more time meditating on verses 4, 5, and 6 of Exodus 20 where it says this. The sins of the fathers will be visited on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. There's a lot to be pondered in these verses. Now, some Bible apologists, Sunday keepers, Sabbath keepers, they want to claim that these verses say that the iniquities of the fathers will be on the third and fourth generation if, and only if, the third and fourth generation, like their fathers, also hate God and reject him. But it doesn't say that. When it talks about hating God in this verse, it's exclusively talking about the fathers. Mm. The hating of God part in this passage is not describing the thinking of the third and fourth generation. It's talking exclusively about the first generation of obedient ones and how the next generations are going to suffer. Now, I'm not relying on the King James Version alone. That's what I just read from. I'm not relying on that one alone for this understanding. Most, if not all, of the other translations basically say the same thing, that it's on the parents. And that is that the suffering of future, future generations is not because of their hatred for God. It's because of the hatred of their fathers, the first generation. Now, this passage that I just read seems like a very unfair situation. Why should the third and fourth generation have to suffer for the sins of the fathers. Some say, why is God so mean? You've heard that, haven't you? And here's where we have to understand an important truism. Let's talk about syphilis. Someone says, what? what? Yeah, let's talk about this horrible venereal disease because this major illness is directly tied in with our topic of nature versus nurture. This disease that I'm talking about is directly tied to the belief that man suffers from sin supposedly at the hands of God. And I don't think the world has a proper understanding of sin and God supposedly punishing us when we sin. Sometimes he does, but sometimes he does not. Sometimes we suffer not because God's punishing us, but for some other reason. That's why we suffer. Let's delve into this. But first, I got to tell you something important. We're, we're going to get back to this, but real, just real quick. On Start Our Sabbath, we never ask you for money. At Dynamic Christian Ministries and uh, Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we refuse money from our viewers. We're not in this for the money. We don't do it for the money. This is a labor of love that we do for other people, so never send us money. But we do ask you for things. We're very unashamed in our asking you for things. We ask you for prayers. We do. And we ask that you please hit the share button. Hit that share button. We ask that if you find, notice I got if in there. Yeah. We're not share shaming. We ask that if you find this show informative, please share it with other people mm -hmm. that you might know who could also find it informative. And Bill's really good about reminding them throughout the show in the chat room yes. that this is a good time to share. And you That's don't, right. if you want to share, you don't have to share just once. Yeah. Share, share multiple times. Share it a bunch of times. Also, for those of you who insist on, uh, they say, well, we want to send money somewhere. Well, there, here are two places that Nancy and I support financially. Church of God, Seventh Day. The, uh, you can send them checks. Uh, this uh, is Their address is at 12513 Chapman Road, Tyler, Texas, 75708. 
and this is a local congregation, or the Tabitha Outreach Foundation, care of Diane Webb. The address is 398 County Road 1597, Avenger, Texas 75630. Nancy and I don't get any of that money. We don't get a kickback. We don't get a finder's fee. No. That's just place. That's just a couple places that we support. And if you want to send your money, send it there. All and right. I did want to mention that Diane Webb is in the chat room tonight, or she was earlier. So if you've got any questions about yes. the Tab Tabitha Outreach Project, you can ask her. Yeah, we talked about it at great length on previous programs. We don't have time to talk about it. Talk to Diane Webb directly. All right, let's get back to syphilis. Let me state a fact. It is an absolute fact that this horrible venereal disease called syphilis would not exist if it weren't for sin. If people only had sex between one husband and one wife, there would be no way for syphilis to spread among people. In a completely monogamous world, syphilis would be completely gone. It would die out. Syphilis is a horrible disease, and not just because of what it does to the adults who have it and, and what it does to the others that get infected by those who have it. It's also a horrible disease because of what it does to the children of those parents who have the disease. Children of parents who have syphilis are often born with, defect, with defects. That's if they're lucky enough to be born at all because syphilis also causes miscarriages and stillbirths. Mm -hmm. And this disease we're talking about, syphilis, is not just a malady of today. Syphilis goes back a long way in man's history, thousands of years mm -hmm. ago, ancient times. Here's an example from hundreds of years ago. You probably know about King Henry VIII, uh, of England. He had all these wives. Whenever Henry had a wife who wouldn't have kids or couldn't have kids, he'd get rid of her. And as a result, Henry VIII went through several wives. Two of his wives kept having miscarriages, Catherine and Anne Boleyn. And Henry, Henry blamed them for not being able to give him a son. Mm -hmm. But was it the fault of the wives who kept miscarrying? Medical historians say that these miscarriages were a result of Henry having syphilis. Mm -hmm. And you see it's documented that Henry got this disease when he was a young man, before he was married, he was sleeping around with a lot of women when he was single. So Henry's disease not only caused himself suffering, he couldn't produce a son, and he had all these physical symptoms that you get from syphilis, but Henry's sin also caused the suffering for his wives who got the disease from him. And he ended up having to kill a couple of them, you know, unfairly. And here's the worst part, it caused his unborn children to die. Back to the question, why does God punish innocent offspring of sinners? That's so unfair. These people say that just because Henry was a sinner, that doesn't mean God had to punish Henry's children. That is not a valid observation. God created man in a certain way and tells man to live his life in a certain way. And this stuff is very clearly put in the Bible. It's very clear. Check this out. God makes it very clear in his written word that we are not to fornicate. I mean, isn't that a no-brainer? Isn't that a flea fornication? Henry VIII knew that the Bible forbids fornication and all acts of sexual uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Henry was an educated man. He studied the Bible from his youth by highly qualified clergymen. He was educated by the church. He knew that fornication was wrong, but he chose to disobey God's law, the law that even the most gold-witted person can understand. When God created man, his creation was absolutely not designed for the purpose of having multiple sex partners. We're told that it's forbidden to fornicate and we're told it's forbidden to commit adultery. Now, somebody help me out in the chat room. Post those scriptures that are against fornication and adultery. Put them in. I didn't have time to look them up. But come on. The Bible is very clear on this. So when man disobeys God and he fornicates, he commits adultery, and as a result, other people suffer, how is that God's fault? It's not. Now, so I know some of you are not going to agree with me on this, so let's ask a question. Bear with me. Indulge me, humor me. Suppose I buy a little compact car made by Ford. Mm -hmm. Suppose I then use that car for heavy duty work, like carrying big rocks in the trunk. Ford did not design that car to be carrying heavy rocks in the trunk. So when the axle breaks, and it will, do I then blame Ford? 
Or let's take this analogy one step further. What if my kid buys this little compact car and then I borrow it from him, I misuse it and I break it. My kid has to suffer, why? Because of my stupidity. Mm -hmm. Do I then blame Ford? Should my kid then blame Ford? No, the problem is me because I did something to that car that Ford never intended for it to do. Syphilis is just one of many examples of what happens when a person misuses his body totally contrary to what God has designed it to do. And then when things go bad, they want to blame God, and that's ludicrous. All right, we'll get into that more in a bit. Right, well, we're going to be over time, but, you know, we haven't been here for two weeks, so, be, so we're hoping you'll bear with us. Right now, let's bear down on a point that we uh, we're stressing on this segment. When the sins of the fathers are inflicted on the next generations. Don't blame God, because God is not evil. He's not mean. God has mercy, and he will grant healing to those who do what they're supposed to do, that is, following his instructions in the Bible. I mean, let's get back to my little Ford car. When you buy a car from, uh, from Ford, they give you a manual. Follow the manual, and things are usually gonna go pretty good for that car. God gives us his manual. Follow the manual and things are usually going to go real well for you. God wants to be merciful to us. He wants us to succeed. He loves us. And we've got to quit blaming God for the bad stuff that man does, bad stuff that ends up hurting innocent bystanders. All right, let's interject an important point about rejection of God. This is just an aside to the conversation, but I, I had to throw this in tonight because it's an important one. When we talk about rejecting God, we're not just talking about rejecting God's law. There are other ways to reject God other than rejecting God's law. And a lot of Sabbath keepers don't get this. They don't get the distinction. They seem to think that God's law is synonymous with God. But God's law is only one aspect of God's personality. God's personality also includes love and forgiveness. Lots and lots of love and forgiveness. Amen. Mm -hmm. So if we're great at keeping God's law, but we have no love, no forgiveness, then we're rebelling against God. We're rejecting God because he doesn't just tell us to obey his law. Obedience to God is more than just obeying the law. God also tells us we got to love and God also tells us we got to forgive. So Please don't fall into the trap of thinking that rebelling against God is only rebelling against his law. We also rebel against God when we don't show love and forgiveness. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Amen. All right. Back, let's make clarification. We're going to back up. Because we need to understand that like Proverbs 22, 6, Exodus 20, verse 5, doesn't necessarily happen all the time. That's true. Exodus 20 verse 5 is not some ironclad rule that you're going to see happen every time a sin is committed. I mean, we all know plenty of people who are unrepentant fornicators or flagrant adulterers who can and do end up with kids who do not suffer from the effects of their father's sins. You know people like that, so do I. And why don't they suffer? Why don't children always suffer because of the, the, the things about the parents? If Exodus 20, 20, verse 5, is a hard and fast rule, why do children of unrepentant fornicators and adultery, adulterers, why do these children end up not suffering to the third and fourth generation? Now, Bill and I were talking about the Western mind this last week. The Western mind. I don't mean like, you know, out west in Colorado. We're talking about Western civilization. Bill and I were talking about how as people who live in Western civilization, we make the mistake of viewing the Bible through Western eyes. But the Bible is not a Western book. It's an Eastern book. It's not a book written by Catholics or Protestants, Europeans, Americans. It's not a book by Americans, Europeans, you know, Protestants and Catholics. It's not, no. It's an Eastern book. And because it's an Eastern book, we sometimes want to insert our Western way of thinking into its passages. As Westerners, we don't like ambiguity. We want 100% certainty. And we find it hard to accept general principles a lot of times. So when we hear general principles, we try to turn them into hard and fast rules. And that doesn't always work 
with an Eastern book like the Bible. All right, back to our point about God wanting to show mercy. He really wants to show mercy. He's not some vengeful, hateful God like we see in Jonathan Edwards' thing, sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's not God. And while we should study Exodus 20, verse 5, we should also look at the following. And let's set the stage for our final point by talking about the immortality of the soul. It's like, what? Wasn't we gone off on another tangent? But this this relates. Hang in there. And when I say immortality of the soul, I should probably say the non-immortality of the soul. Because the fact is the soul does die. Scripture is clear. Now, most of us who don't believe in the immortality of the soul, we love to quote Ezekiel 19, where it says, the soul that sins, it shall die. But you know, it just might be helpful if we were to read the whole scripture in context. The soul who sins shall die. Again, it doesn't stop. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And please don't be confused. Ezekiel 19 is not at odds with Exodus 24. Ezekiel 19 just shows that Exodus 20, verse 4, is a principle which has exceptions. Again, Exodus 20, verse 4 is not a hard and fast rule. All right, let's end this because I want to go to the chat room. Uh, some of you who haven't fallen asleep or shut off your computer or go to bed, you're still here. We want to hear from you in the chat room. Let's end this by asking if there's something that we can learn from this. Let's wind this up by acknowledging that some scriptures about raising a child seem to lean toward nurture. And then there are scriptures about children and grandchildren suffering because of the actions of the previous generations that seem to lean toward nature. So again, we've got to acknowledge we don't have perfect understanding in this age. And we need to spend considerable time praying and meditating on subjects like this. But here's a point I want to stress, because it has to do with relationships with others. And remember that Christianity is not about your relationship with a corporation <clears throat> or a church organization. Mm -hmm. That's not Christianity. Christianity is about your relationship with your brother, your relationship with God above all things, but it has to do with your relationship with your brother and not with some church organization. That's right. Not that church organizations are bad, they're good, they serve their purpose, but people have a tendency to be more loyal to a church corporation, a church organization, than they are to their own brothers, and that's wrong. Okay, a little interjection. Now, in SOS, we don't try to spend a lot of time on the subject of people who have been hurt in their lives. Mm -hmm. We spend time on it. Tonight's one of those nights we need to address it. Some of you out there are trying to heal from the hurts that you have experienced at the hands of others. The hurt that you've experienced could have come from the authoritarian church leaders you've experienced, from abusive parents, from an ex-spouse, all kinds of places. When abuse happens, usually you want to know. I mean, I know you're asking this question if you've been abused. Why did this person do this to me? I hear this all the time from people who have been abused. Why did he do this to me? And, and let's be clear, we gotta do another interjection. When abuse happens, we never, never, never want to excuse the behavior of the abuser. Have, have, have I been real clear on that yeah, point? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let me say it again. We never want to excuse the behavior of the abuser. Right. But it does help when we understand the person who is or was the abuser. Mm -hmm. In our search, for understanding this person many times, we find that this abuser had himself been abused in the past by another person. Mm -hmm. Chances are that he was, the, uh, was a victim of both nature and nurture. Then years later, he abused because he was so damaged way back then, damaged by his parents, a church leader, somebody. And when you look at his abuser from a longer time ago, you find that his abuser had been abused also way back in time. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that the abuse cycle can go back countless generations. And this shouldn't surprise us because this is Satan's world. Now, if you have been abused, does this mean that you need to say, oh, 
he was abused just like I was, so I need to be back involved in his life even though he's still dangerous. Do we? No, 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 no. We're not. As you work through your healing process, you do not put yourself into the path of an abuser. Right. You don't put yourself into harm's way, even when the abuser claims repentance. Because sometimes his repentance is either flawed or he thinks he's repenting and he hasn't, or it's insincere. So don't, don't, don't get back into it. The point is, in understanding, we know that a lot of this has to do with nature and nurture, that this abuse cycle goes back generation after generation. All right, this whole thing is a whole different subject. I only bring it up because it does tie in with the nature versus nature. And, and I bring it up because it's important that I remind you over and over on this show, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, this is Satan's world. This world is always going to be filled with evil. It's going to be this way till Jesus returns. And you can do your part to make it a little better here and there, but you're not going to change people on a massive scale by passing some law or electing some guy or whatever. You're not going to change human nature. It has to be done through the church, through God's word, through the Holy Spirit. That's where change comes, and it's always, almost always some small thing. we got too many people that are trying to change a whole nation by passing some laws. That's not going to work. As a Christian who recognizes this important point, it is your job to make your relationship with God even stronger. Ask God for his intervention and protection in your life. Make wise decisions and always pray, thy kingdom come, because this world really is going to be cleaned up. It's going to be cleaned up. Jesus is going to return. He's going to make it right. And you hold firmly to that knowledge. Hold on to it with everything you've got because it's going to happen. And God loves you and you will get through this. Okay, Nancy, what have you got for us in the chat room? Um, I'm going to start with a, uh, some things from YouTube. Um, Carl Nottrieff says maybe sometime you can also talk about the epigenome uh, that can mark DNA. And the what? Epigenomes. Oh, uh, epigenomes. That, they, yeah. that can pass the changes down to their children. In case you had to Google that, I did. An epigenome consists of a record of the chemical changes to the DNA and histone pr proteins of an organization. These organi organisms, these changes can be passed down to an organism's offspring via transgenerational inheritance. Yeah, Carl brings up an excellent point, and that is that. Scientists now today are amazed at um, uh, things that get transmitted from generation to generation, yeah. things that they never would have dreamed right, 100 years right. ago when they started understanding genetics mm -hmm. or 50 years ago when they started understanding DNA. They never would have dreamed that the, the uh, DNA could actually be changed in the way that it's being changed because of actions that people are doing. So that, that's an excellent thing. Um, and again, I'm very ignorant on this, and I'll, I'll make a stab at it, Carl, but if I come across as in my research and start putting something together, if I start coming across really stupid, I'm going to have to pass on it. But it is a fascinating <laughs> subject. Okay. Oh, before you go on, I want to mention, somebody asked a question. They said um, uh, regarding Bill's segment, didn't the city of Big Sandy have a uh, Church of God mayor? Actually, they had three. One of them is our brother-in-law, Wayne Weiss, uh -huh. who is the mayor of Big mm -hmm. Sandy. Uh, before him was Sonny Parsons. Yes, he was in the church. At, at one of, he's been mayor a couple of times. Mayor a couple of times. And before him... David Smith. David Smith. I couldn't yeah. think of the two, name. Two of the three were mentioned in the chat room. Oh, they were. Okay. Yes. so all right. you, you mentioned Wayne. I typed for you. Okay. All right. So you guys <laughs> got this all figured yeah, out in well, the chat nobody, room. I, and I'm just blithering like an idiot. I forgot Sonny Parsons was one. Oh, so he wasn't in the chat no, room. So I did all for something. Two, okay. two out of three were. I okay. forgot about that. All right. Okay, so Trudy also, uh, Cranford mentions, uh, for yourself, you need to forgive the abuser and move on, not for the abuser, but for yourself. That's right. And talking about nature versus nurture, Trudy also said earlier that the government, the schools, and peer pressure are big stumbling blocks for our children. Yeah, that's right. Look at this. We've already got 250 comments. That's right. Um, wow, 251 comments. That's awesome. 66 shares. Thank you. You guys are doing great tonight. Hey, are they talking about the new equipment at all? Uh, they didn't mention the equipment. They mentioned the digs. I was just going to read what Paul Shaw said. He said he likes the new set. Looks like a lot of our tech problems have been solved. 
And um, a lot of people, you know, have said in the chat room that they're really happy we're back after a couple of weeks. Okay, of but the technology is is working tonight. I think so. I think so. All right. Other than saying we were a little quiet in the beginning, yeah. something no one ever says to me. Yeah, no one ever says that to Nancy. So. <laughs> Richard but, Maxwell t says, talking about my segment, when they say peace and safety, then destruction will fall uh -huh. upon them. And he also said that we read the back of the book and know what will happen. That's right. So we know what's going to happen. Will of Love Al says, but we, you know, again, from my segment, we have to seek first the kingdom of God. And Marion Young Perkins says, we must be faithful um, during good times and bad times. So uh, a lot of important things. Okay, do we have a prayer request? Rob Kuzman writes about Liz suffering from a ruptured soul, shoulder and is oh, in severe I, pain. I missed that. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's add Rob Kuzman. Y'all are keeping a prayer list, right? Whoa. And add uh, Liz. Uh, onto the prayer list because she's suffering from a ruptured soldier and, and shoulder and she's in pain so please add that to your prayer list okay okay what else we got okay uh, Lee Lehman says uh, Philippians 4 11 through 13 Paul found uh, contentment in whatever state he found yes. himself both a base or a bound yeah what scripture is that uh, Philippians 4 11 through 13 Philippians 4 11 that's an excellent scripture and Paul says, uh, "It was through Christ who strengthened him." Yeah, and, and he says, "Be content mm -hmm. with with the situation that you're." Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do better. There's nothing wrong with trying to improve ourselves. Sure, sure. And encouraging our kids to get an education, learn a trade, right, right. Go if, to college, if whatever. If you lose your job, you just don't sit at home. You just sit there. Mm -hmm. But when it says to be content, that th whatever you do have. Be happy with it mm -hmm. as you continue to maybe do better on yeah, it. And look look at the blessings that you do have. We always have yes. salvation through Jesus that yes. can't be taken away from us. If we lose our job or we get sick or that kind of thing, that's that's something we always have. Um, hopefully, you know, um, the love of family and friends. There's a lot of things we can be thankful for. Yes. Um, but, I, you know, I don't want to belittle people's horrible situations, but we have a responsibility to try to find... Uh, things to be thankful for um, uh, in this life. Okay, we got another prayer request. And I, I, I'm back to I can only see certain things. Um, Bonita Miller writes and she talks about her son Shane. She wants us to pray for Shane. He's suffering from anxiety and panic attacks. So, um, anxiety. So please pray for Shane. Um, this is uh, Bonita Miller's son. Add that to your prayer list, please. Because prayer is important. We can't just pray about ourselves. We, we got to spend time praying for other people, being concerned, the outgoing concern that love is. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else we got? So there were a lot of people mentioning others who've been in government that were um, uh, in in politics as well. Um, so, uh, and then there are people who are sharing their experiences in the church. For example, Beth Hester says, mm -hmm. "I can relate to this. Two of her family." Uh, accepted God's teaching and two did not and in my own family my sister and I are in a Sabbath keeping church um, I have a sister who goes to church but it's not it's a Sunday keeping church mm -hmm. and then um, uh, brothers who one claims to be an atheist so so um, if it if it were how the parents <coughs> raised them there you know there wouldn't there could be some variety but they, yeah. we still were raised taught the same yeah, thing but, so. but stop feeling guilty about it you know yeah uh, were you talking to me everybody <laughs> everybody <laughs> um okay so uh several had said that they have characteristics of a parent who they never knew or didn't know till late really? in life because they were adopted mimi was one of them really mm -hmm. and she found out that she has characteristics of her natural mother or her father father okay her that's interesting mm -hmm. okay even though she, she speaks like him even though she didn't meet him until her 40s she, really she speaks like him even though she didn't meet him until okay. she was in her okay. 40s that's fascinating yeah did anybody disagree and say that's a bunch of hogwash no 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 we got, i mean if you can if you can genetically be like your parent in your look even though you know um, you're in a different environment or whatever, yeah. uh, there you've got to you've got to accept that other yeah. genetically identified markers do that. Now, I suppose if your father was in England and you were in mm. the United States, your accents might be different yeah. if you never met him. But maybe right. not. But 
it, it is fascinating to me a lot of thing a lot more things that the scientists are finding out that can be um, passed along and I want to mention something and maybe somebody will do some research that I heard from uh, from a friend of mine at one time now uh, she was relating a story she'd read so you know I'm getting it third hand but that people <coughs> who had had um, uh, surgery to, to like a heart replacement, a kidney replacement or whatever, feel like they have some feelings and thoughts of the other person because all the mental, all the connectors, all the neurons connect. Mm -hmm. And I don't, like I said, I don't know if that's true, but I find it fascinating because those things, go, going back to the um, uh, epigenomes where a chemical can change things, if something affected that person's character, you now have their DNA in your body, right. and so right. perhaps it could impact it yes. could impact you that way. And I don't I don't know about thoughts and feelings, but there definitely could be some things that that you would pull in from that person. That's why they try to get the best match possible. Right, and that's why Jehovah's Witnesses say not only should you not have blood transfusions, you should not have um, transplants of organs or skin or anything like that. Because you're taking on the, the uh, DNA of a completely different person yeah. who's unrelated. Yeah. So that, I think that's interesting that that's their stand. What else you got in the chat room for us? Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, Diane Webb um, sort of amened and echoed your that the church leadership was uh, put mm. the stumbling block in front of, uh, of the parents, I guess, in trying to raise their mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had some other and because the, because too many times in, in the organization she's describing the leadership the ministry that's supposed to be looking at the flock after the flock their number one goal was maintaining the organization the income flow salaries for the ministry and all that and they sh their first priority should have been the people the brethren mm -hmm. okay right. but we, we don't need that's to spend right. a lot of time on that John Black says one of the pastors of my local congregation whom I've known for over 40 years now has his youngest son as a lead pastor of our congregation his older son and daughter are not church going I asked him this week when did your parents religion mm -hmm. become your religion his reply was that it was a process over time mm -hmm. that's an interesting question um, I do remember uh, mm -hmm. Kelly Hogg saying, I think it was Kelly Hogg, who uh, used to work with us on the website, and by the way, needs prayers too, because she's got this flu thing and she's been in the hospital. Okay. Um, that her parents raised her to, to in that light, you know, like, you need to accept this, you need to research this, you need to do this. And I think with a lot of parents, we raise them saying, this is the way, you know, you need to accept it, whereas... If, if this is the person I was thinking about, her parents said, this is our religion, we're gonna tell you about it, but um, we want, and we want you to make it yours, but it's not yours because it's ours, yeah, kind exactly. of thing. So that's an interesting take on yeah. it. Um, Alicia Monroe Prime says she grew up in atheist home, but even as a young child believed there was a God and prayed. Good, that's interesting. Alicia, okay, thank mm -hmm. you Alicia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Richard Maxwell says it's not uncommon for God to blame uh, for people to blame God for everything bad that happens in the world. It's not God; it's sin that's responsible for it. In heaven, there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, and sin will not rise again. I'm looking forward to the kingdom: no more tears, no more sorrow, yeah. no more crying. That was Richard Maxwell, right? Yes. Thank yes. you, Richard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Mary Epper joined us and oh. says hello. Yeah, she wasn't there in the beginning, but I let her know we talked about her. You told her I thanked her for the guitar yes, and the auto harp. Yes, the guitar is here, but the auto harp still isn't. The thing that came FedEx got here right away. The stuff through the U.S. mail is taking forever. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but thank you, Mary. It'll get That's here. That's right. Alicia Monroe Prime also adds that her mother started believing a couple of years ago. When she, when I took the gospel tour and started asking questions about the way out, the way I was living, she noticed me changing. Good, praise God. And you know, a lot of times, almost all the time, it's how we act, not what we say, that changes people. Because people, yeah, you know, was that saying? I, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions are, are right. talking over them or speaking louder yeah. or whatever. So, and uh, Daryl Ambrose says, "Thank God for His mercy." That's always something we want to be thankful for, no matter what our circumstances yeah. are. Uh, Lee Listman says, but still, uh, so talking about raising your children, uh, teaching them the Bible, 
teaching the scriptures and the law, and you said love and forgiveness. Uh, Lee says, but still the lessons of honesty, morality, and character that the parents trained up their children by teaching an example probably continued on with the children as adults, and even if they left the church. Yeah. Um, many of us may not have church going or baptized offspring yet, but they are good adults who benefited from what they learned from their yeah, parents. Yeah, absolutely. And that's right. Um, as, a, as a parent who raised three children who aren't Sabbath keepers, um, it is good to know that, that uh, you know, when you in, try to instill character, you know, don't steal, don't lie, yeah. you know, work hard, those kinds of things can be instilled as yeah. well. And what about you, Wes? You were not raised in uh, worldwide or any church like that. Your mother did send you to church, but uh, neither parent modeled that example nor particularly taught you to be a good person, no. uh, and nor particularly modeled it. <laughs> right. So um, what's in your DNA? Who knows? <laughs> so uh, what, what would you say, how would you explain your conversion? Nature, uh, I, nurture? I was called. Uh -huh. you know, the thing has nothing to do with nature or nurture. God just called me from a godless family and um, a very unhappy family, and... Uh, he brought me into his truth, and it's that simple. Nothing complicated about it. So, anything else in the chat room? Uh, Horst Obermeid says he was listening to an interview with a doctor who does transplants. He's written a book titled From Death to Life or something similar. He said that some transplant recipients get a desire to eat certain foods they did not normally yes. eat, but found it was the favorite food of the person who yes. donated the heart. Yes, excellent point. Thank you, Horst. Yes. Because that person's DNA is now in in his yeah, body. Yeah, thanks, Fact, thanks for adding that because yeah. of, of us talking about it uh, for quoting and, that. And you take somebody who's had multiple organ, uh, organ transplants, uh, like a, a, a diabetic will get a, um, um, a kidney and a um, pancreas mm -hmm. from the same person. And then he's kind of got a double dose of that sure. DNA within him. So. Ooh, what if you have transplants from multiple people? Well, I... I don't think that happens very much, but mm -hmm. okay. So what, what else you got? It's about time to shut this down. Yeah, I think it is. Time. I think I think we're good for now. Sorry if we missed your your comments or questions. We are super excited that you were talking in the chat room, um, encouraging each other, um, adding uh, to what we're talking about. Diane Webb puts a um, a title to what Horst said. The molecular memory. Yeah. And I think if you googled that, you would find a lot more about this subject. It's fascinating. Yeah. But of course, you know, that's the whole purpose of having the Holy Spirit in us because then we have God's DNA in us yes. on a spiritual molecular level. And that should be what we should start craving the things he craves right. and thinking the things he thinks and speaking the way he speaks right. and acting the way he acts. I mean, that's his DNA in us. So circles it all back to a spiritual side. Exactly. And we need to start emulating him more and not mm -hmm. fighting that DNA that sure. he inserts into us mm -hmm. with his Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay, let's close with prayer, and then we're going to shut this down. Um, but first, I want to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Yes. Um, give us your feedback uh, on the technology, any suggestions. We need to turn up the volume. Um, I, I can see some things here that I need to fix for next time, and hopefully they weren't too much of a distraction. But thank you for bearing with us. And hopefully we got this all settled and taken care of in our $150 a month studio that didn't cost us a million dollars. All right, let's bow your heads, please. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you. We thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you that you blessed the technology. We thank you that you uh, blessed the conversation that we had, that there was so much love shown to one another in the chat rooms tonight. We thank you, Father, that your people are not only obedient in the law, but they also have love, they also have forgiveness. So we thank you for that, Father, that you've put that Holy Spirit into us so we can comport ourselves properly. Now, Father, we ask that for the remainder of this Sabbath day, you put your blessing on our efforts. Please guide and direct everything that we do and say, and we give you thanks and ask all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you so much. Come back next week. We will... God willing, be back next week That's in our right. new we'll be here. Uh, $150 Woo! studios. In the meantime, have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Okay, I wonder how to end, we end this now. There's uh, different buttons to push. That's why you had buttons. trouble with uh, bringing Bill on tonight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and plus, you had to push him. I normally push that button.